you have your Bible, I encourage you to take it, take it out and open it to the Gospel of Luke, 13th chapter. The Gospel of Luke, 13th chapter. If I had to title this message, I would probably title it, Through the Narrow Door. Through the Narrow Door. We will be reading Luke chapter 13, verses 22 and 30. Before we get there, let's kind of set the Gospel of Luke in its proper place, in its proper context. Before we do that, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had the thought, am I... Am I truly saved? When nobody's around, have you ever sat there and thought for a second, am I really saved? Or have you ever had the thought, how can so-and-so, whoever so-and-so is to you, appear to be so godly, appear to be this great Christian, serve God in the church, and then just fall away? If you've ever had one or both of those thoughts, then today's message might be of interest to you. What we're about to read is actually, the Gospel of Luke is actually the first of a two-volume work. It was penned by a guy named Luke. Luke was not an apostle. He was a Gentile convert. He was funded by Theophilus to investigate the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and then to report on what he had discovered. And so when you read Luke and Acts, they go together. The Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, they go together. They were both written by Luke. And it was written for a very simple purpose, to strengthen the faith of the Gentile believers, to show that they have been granted full membership into the family of God. And the book of Acts talks about the power of the Holy Spirit in and through his church to advance the kingdom of God all over the globe. So that's kind of the reason Luke and Acts was written. And now the passage we're about to read, Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through 30, comes in a narrative of scripture. It's called Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. From Luke chapter 9 to Luke chapter 19, Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. And as he's going to Jerusalem, he is teaching about discipleship. He's calling people out of the world into the kingdom of God. And he is intentionally and purposely irritating, antagonizing the Jewish leadership. Because in Jerusalem is where he's going to be crucified. So that's kind of what's going on. Now let's read our text. It's Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through 30. And all scripture today will be from the English Standard Version. Our text reads, He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few. And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. But once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, but we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from the north and south and recline at the table of the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first. And some are first who will be last. Now, I'll go ahead and clear something up right off the bat. Most people who've been in church for any length of time zero in 
on one statement. Lord, with those who are saved, be few. And they're like, see, only a small amount of people are going to be saved. Let me clear something up right off the bat. This is not a predictive prophecy that was to be true for all times. Jesus was talking to a very select group of people, the Jews. They said, Lord, did we eat and drink in your presence? You taught in our streets. Like, he's talking to one generation, and he said, they asked the question, well, will few be saved? He didn't even answer the question. He turns it right to this. Will you be saved? Quit speculating about how many people are going to be saved. The question is, will you be saved? Now, I'm of the opinion there's going to be multitudes upon multitudes upon multitudes in heaven. In fact, according to Galatians chapter 2, about Jesus gets the preeminence of all things. I'm of the opinion that heaven is going to be more populated than hell. What, give, what gives God more glory? To have hell overpopulated or heaven populated? Thank you. Amen. That was sermon number one. Amen. And now I'm moving on to the real sermon. Here we go. If I could take Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through 30, and encapsulate those texts in one sentence, it would be this. The Jews must enter the kingdom of God through the narrow door. That's what was happening. You see, what prompted the question was this. The Jews in Jesus' day had the thought that they were the only ones going to be saved. And that's why he asked the question, will only few be saved? Because as Jesus is going to Jerusalem, from Luke chapter 9 to Luke chapter 19, man, he is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. Things are happening. Gentiles are coming into the kingdom. Women are coming into the kingdom. And this Jew is having his mind blown. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Aren't only a few going to be saved? And Jesus says, look, if you're, going to enter through the king, if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to come through the narrow door. Now, how does that apply to us today? Very simple. Change the sentence. If you are going to enter the kingdom of God, you must come through the narrow door. How, how does one enter through the narrow door? There are three requirements in order to enter the kingdom through the narrow door. Number one, the first requirement to enter the kingdom of God through the narrow door is to locate the narrow door. Ha! Pretty obvious, isn't it? Locate the narrow door. Look at the text, Luke chapter 13 and verse number 24. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and would not be able. So many of the Jews in Jesus' day would not be saved. But by the end of the passage that we read, Jesus turned to the global mission of the church and he said, many from the north, south, east, and west are coming to the kingdom of God. So in one sense, only a small amount of people will be saved, the small amount of Jews in Jesus' day. But by the end of the text, Great multitudes from all over the planet are coming into the kingdom of God. It starts out like a grain of mustard seed, but it grows into a great big tree. The kingdom of God is growing and advancing. Listen to this. In order to enter into the kingdom of God through the narrow door, the first thing you've got to do is locate the narrow door. Jesus said so in Luke 13 and verse 24. What's the narrow door? Who's the narrow door? Jesus is the narrow door. Listen to this. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 7 through 9. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus said he is the narrow door. And his 
sheep hear his voice. They follow his leading and they enter through the narrow door. The goats do not, but the sheep do. They come and they come through the narrow door. And the reason why the door is narrow is because Jesus is the only way to be saved. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Again, Jesus is in essence saying, I am the narrow door. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 12. There is salvation in no one else. There is salvation in no one else. And there was no other name under heaven given among men, which we must be saved. And so Jesus is the narrow door. He said he was. And he is the narrow door because he is the only way to be saved. There is no other way to heaven. Buddha won't get you to heaven. Muhammad will not get you to heaven. Humanism, secularism, whatever else you want to name it, it will not get you to heaven. The only way to heaven is to come through the door, which is Jesus Christ. If, if you go to somebody's house, if you go to somebody's house, I hesitate to use this as an illustration because I'm pretty sure there's an idiot in here that's done this at some point. Sorry, sort of, kind of. But when you go to somebody's house to visit, you probably don't go around to the back of the house, climb the fence, walk around and check the windows until you find one that's been left unlocked, raise the window, somehow get your old overweight self into the house and then walk into the living room and go, hey guys, what's happening? Like, that's a pretty good way to get shot. Like, that's not the way that you enter somebody's house. Typically, you pull up to somebody's house and you locate the proper door. You know what I'm saying? Like, like if, if, if you're kind of expected and they like you, you get to go through the back door of the garage. If you're not expected, and you only come every so often, like once a year, you go to the front door. That's the way it rolls in the South, right? Regardless, when you go to somebody's house, you typically locate the proper door, and you walk up to that door, and you ask permission to come into the house. You knock, you ring the doorbell, you talk to the doorbell, whatever, but somehow you get permission to enter the house. And that's the way it is in the kingdom of God. In order to enter the kingdom of God, you have to locate the proper door. And if I've already mentioned, it's not Mohammed, it's not Buddha, it's not Hare Krishna, it's not David Koresh, and the list goes on and on. The proper door is Jesus. And you come to that door and you ask permission to enter the kingdom of God. How do you, how do you ask permission to enter the kingdom of God? You repent of your sin and you place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Jesus came to this earth born of a virgin who lived a sinless life. He did not commit one evil or one sin in thought or action. And yet he willingly gave his body to be beat, to be whipped, to be pierced, hung upon a tree where he died. He was buried in a tomb and on the third day he rose again. He stayed on the earth for 40 days. He gave many infallible proofs that he is indeed the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He ascended into heaven and one day he's coming back for all those who believe in him. And if you believe in your heart that message and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you are saved. You are granted permission. You get to come through the narrow door and you enter the kingdom of God.
The first, the first requirement to enter the kingdom of God is to come through the narrow door. The second requirement to enter the kingdom through the narrow door is to labor to enter through the narrow door. Now again, look at your text in Luke chapter 13 and verse number 24. Luke 13 and verse number 24. Strive. Strive. It does not read stroll. <laughs> Waltz. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Let's, let's get some clarity here. Go to the Gospel of Matthew. It'll come on your screen. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. And Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, this is Matthew's version of this conversation of what happened. And listen to what Matthew writes. In Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Again, if you read Matthew chapter 7 and 8, it's proper context. Jesus is dealing with a small subset group of people answering his question. But the point I want to draw your attention to is this. The main idea that's being communicated here is simply this. It is labor intensive to follow Christ. Now, now we don't have to despair because if you're really in Christ, the Holy Spirit empowers you to do so. But nonetheless, it is labor intensive to follow Christ. In other words, it's not the easy way. It's not the easy life to be a follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus told us in John 16 and verse 33 that in this world, in this life, you're going to have tribulations. He, he told us in Luke 9 verse 23 that if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you are expected to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him daily. Not on Sundays only. Wednesdays if you're super spiritual. Like every day you take up your cross, you deny yourself, and you follow Jesus Christ. It requires commitment, it requires dedication, and it requires effort. It requires pain. Because to follow Jesus Christ, you take up your cross. In other words, you crucify yourself daily to follow Jesus Christ. You don't get to live by your desires. You don't get to live by your agenda. You don't get to do what you want to do in the kingdom of God. Instead, you take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. It's labor intensive. And thus the need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We know what it's like to enter, to enter through narrow spaces, don't we? We know what it's like to enter through the narrow door, don't we? Especially when somebody parks too close to your vehicle while you're in the store. Right? You come out and you're like... Now, some of you that are not as horizontally challenged as others, you don't understand... The struggle, but the struggle's real. <laughs> it is. You, you look at your vehicle, and it's like they parked as close as they possibly could. And then the other guy did the same thing. So you're looking, and there's, there's only one way to enter that door, and that's through that narrow path. So you know what happens, right? Everybody adjusts their clothes. <sighs> they suck it all in. And you, you like, you're maneuvering your body, and you're, you're like a contortionist. 
and you open the door and it's like that much, and you're like that much, and you're trying, you're, you're trying not to breathe, <laughs> right? Why y'all laughing? Because you know it's real. This is true. You finally get that leg in there, and you slide it on in, and you shut, and it's like, But now, the labor's not over. You got a destination to go to, right? You adjust the mirrors, suck it in one more time for the seatbelt, find your playlist, and then you got to concentrate as you drive your particular route to your destination. So it is in the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus has done everything necessary for your salvation. However, when you do enter through the narrow door, the work isn't over. The work is beginning. As you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are expected, I'm expected to do good works, to labor for our king. This is what the scripture reads right in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're saved by grace through faith, not by works or anything that we've done. We're saved by grace through faith. But once we're saved, we are expected to work. We're expected to labor for our king to advance the kingdom of God all over this globe. James said it this way, James chapter 2, verses 17 through 18. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, James, James wasn't saying that you're saved by works. What he's saying was, if you're truly saved, the works are evidence of your salvation. And then he holds up Abraham and Rahab as examples. If you were to read the rest of James chapter 2. He's like, Abraham was willing to put Isaac on the altar to show that he completely trusted God and that God would provide his own sacrifice, which he did in the person of Jesus Christ. He also pointed to Rahab, who, who hid the spies and helped them escape so that Israel could come back and take out Jericho. And he, he said, clearly, that their works didn't equal their salvation, but their salvation led to their works because they had their faith in God, in Yahweh, the one true God. Then they had works that followed their faith. And so it is with us today. You can say that you're saved all you want, but, but if there's no evidence of that, if there's no fruit of repentance, if there's no works that advance the kingdom of God, you really need to search your heart to discover if you're really saved or not. Now, I'm not preaching legalism. I'm not preaching that you're saved by works. I hope I'm being very clear. I'm just simply saying, if you, if you say that you have faith, and yet there's nothing to point to, there's no works or anything of that nature, you're not changed individual, nothing about you has changed, and you're not doing anything to advance the kingdom, you're probably not saved. You see, the second requirement to enter the kingdom of God through the narrow door is the labor to enter through that door. And once you're in that door, the work doesn't end. It's just beginning. You begin to do all that is necessary to advance the kingdom of God on this earth. We could, we could point to the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. That's everybody, right? We go, we make disciples of the nations, baptizing them with the name of the 
Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that he has commanded us. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That requires effort. That requires sacrifice. That requires labor. It requires work to go and to advance the kingdom of God, to make disciples of people. It doesn't just happen. You have to work at it. The third requirement to enter the kingdom through the narrow door is that you live there. Now listen, listen to this. In Luke chapter 13, verses 25 through 30. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And all people will come from east and west and from the north and south and recline at the table of the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. You see, the requirement is not only to enter through the door, to labor and, and to advance the kingdom of God, but to actually live in Christ. When, when we talk about living there, we're talking about being in a familial relationship with Jesus, to, to, to be in his family. You're a part of the family. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17 reads this. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, the language means Daddy God. The idea is you're in the family. You've been adopted into the family of God. You're given all the rights and all the privileges of a member of God's family. And so you can cry out, Daddy God, Abba Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and of children than heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Again, there's that concept, suffering, laboring, working, pain, sacrifice, taking up your cross. That's what it means to be in the kingdom of God. <laughs> you see, when, when we talk about, when we talk about entering, entering the kingdom of God through the narrow door and living there, we're talking about being in a relationship with Christ. It's not just saying, it's not saying that you know Christ. It's not saying that it's actually being in Christ. <laughs> it's, 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 it's abiding in him. It's, 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 it's it's, it's, a, it's a mystical union. It's being in Christ. Jesus, Jesus tried to explain this in John chapter 15, verses 4 through 5. He says, abide in me and I in you. Man, the idea of abiding, I mean being in Christ. Like every day. Not just coming to church on Sunday. I mean, I'm glad you're here. This is part of what it means to be in the family. You gather together with other siblings and you worship the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. It's abiding in Christ every day. Abide in him and he will abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This is the point. It's not just saying that you know Jesus. It's actually knowing Jesus. More importantly, Jesus knowing you. It's abiding in his presence. The Apostle John, he said this in 1 John 1, 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. 
You see, there are many people who say they're part of the family. There are many people who say that they're in God, who say that they're saved, but they walk in darkness. And if that describes you, I love you, but I'm just preaching the Bible, you're a liar. You're not in God. Like if there is no change in you whatsoever, you are not saved. It doesn't matter what you say, because the evidence points otherwise. First John 2, verses 4 through 6. Again, the apostle John writes, Whoever says I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, Jesus is perfect. And we are in the process of being conformed to his image. So we are imperfect. In fact, we would not be perfect or perfected until heaven. But that does not excuse the fact that between now and then, we are in the process of being conformed to the image of Christ. And so we look at Christ and the example that he gave us in his word, and we strive to walk as he walked. We strive to minister as he ministered. If I can word it to you this way, he is our prototype. Everything that he did and said in his earthly ministry is what we, or that's what we aspire to do. And, and if you are really in Christ and you abide in Christ, then you keep his commandments. And the commandments are really simple. Jesus took all of the commandments in the Old Testament and he narrowed it down to two things. He said, love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, body, strength. Love God with all of your being. And love your neighbor as yourself. On these two things hang the law and the prophets. All of the scripture could be boiled down to that. If you love God, then you keep his commandments. You follow his word. You don't look for loopholes. You don't try and reinvent the scripture. You don't try and reinterpret what God has said simply because culture now says one sin is acceptable and another is not. No, we go by the scripture and we don't reinterpret the scripture. God has spoken. He has given us his word. It is the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we have an obligation to rightly divide his word and to live by it. And then you love your neighbor. And if you love your neighbor then you seek to advance the kingdom of God on this earth and you seek to establish biblical principles in every area of life. Because here is the truth of the matter. Christian principles that are rightly applied and lived by bless entire nations, even if every single person in the nation is not saved. And scripture says, oh, the people groan when wicked are in authority. How oh, but the people rejoice when the righteous rule. And the reason is because when biblical principles are rightly applied in culture, everyone benefits from it. <laughs> I mean, just look around the world. Look around the world. Why is it that people are trying their best to come to the West? And certainly not because we're perfect, because we are far, far from it. But with simply this, we were grounded and built on biblical principles. And it gave way to free and prosperous nations. It's also why the enemy is bent on destroying who we are. You might say, or ask yourself, preacher, are you saying that Christianity is superior than all the other religions of the world? Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. And it should be rightly divided, and it should be rightly applied, and everyone prospers. 
But more than just blessing people, it gives us the opportunity to preach the gospel, to bring as many people into the kingdom of heaven as possible. And that's what we're really after, is to preach the gospel and to bring people into the kingdom of God. Let me, give, let, me, let, me try and, let me try and illustrate this for you. If a non-family member comes to your house for a visit, the expectation is they're going to leave at some point. Right? If a non-family member comes to your house for a visit, the expectation is there is, is an exit date in mind. Now, while they're there, they benefit from your hospitality. They actually get to experience some of the joy of being in your house. They actually get to experience some of the benefits and blessings and the joys and even the ups and downs, even maybe some of the struggles that your children are going through, that you're helping them walk in life through. They get to see that. They get to experience that. They get to be a part of that blessing. But they're not really part of the family. And so they never really fully experience the love that you have for your children. And if you were to die, they ain't getting your inheritance. In much the same way, That's the way it is in the church. There are people who are a part of the church. And while they're here in the house, they experience and benefit from the hospitality of the Lord. He is good and gracious. And they get to experience the joy and the benefits and the blessings for being around the other people. Siblings, the children of God. And as God is pouring out blessings on one particular child in the family, the others around him and are connected to him also benefit from it. But that doesn't mean that they're saved. In fact, if that individual dies or the Lord Jesus returns, that person will not receive an inheritance, which is land in the New Jerusalem. Heaven. You realize you have real estate in heaven? That's part of the inheritance. Jesus said in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek shall, this is ours. This is ours. The righteous stay here forever. It is the wicked who are removed. And we have real estate and inheritance. If you, the book of Joshua is about conquering Canaan and then, and then dispersing land allotments to the tribes. And that is a picture of what it is like for us in the spiritual reality. We conquer Canaan. We, we, we are moving toward Canaan, God's promised land for us. But there's coming a day that there's going to be land allotments. And we actually have a place in New Jerusalem. We have an inheritance to look forward to. But people who are just part of the church and aren't really part of the family don't get an inheritance. They can enjoy some of the blessings and benefits from our hospitality and for being in the presence of God and being around us. In other words, if you're a part of this church and the Lord is blessing this church, you too are blessed, even though you may not be saved. Isn't that strange? But it makes sense, right? Because that's how the scripture teaches it works. Now look, the point I want to get across to you is this. Don't think just because you come to church don't think just because you serve in the ministry, and don't think just because you're experiencing some blessings right now that you're saved. That doesn't mean that you're saved. The only way to be saved is to come through the narrow door, which is Jesus Christ. You must repent of your sin and place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and confess that he is Lord. Live for him. That's what it means to enter the kingdom of God. Will you stand your feet with me this morning?
to enter the kingdom of God means you actually live there as part of the family. Again, I stress the point of this passage is that in order to enter the kingdom of God through the narrow door, you must locate the door, you must labor to enter that door. It's not easy. It requires self-denial, faith in Christ. You have to live as part of the family. You don't hang out and come every now and then. You actually become part of the family, adopted into the family of God. If you are not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, I stand here and I say the only way to be saved is to come through the narrow door. And that narrow door is Jesus Christ. There is no other way to heaven. There's no other way. All religions are not equal. All religions do not lead to heaven. There's only one, and his name is Jesus. According to Romans 10, verses 9 through 10, you need to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ came to this earth, that he lived a sinless life, he died on the cross for your sin, he was buried in a tomb, and on the third day he rose again. And you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you are saved. Secondly, if you are a regular church attender, you come here maybe for years. You're part of the church body. You hang out in the church. You serve in ministries of the church. I just, I just want to remind you that that doesn't mean that you're saved. You too must believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, was buried in a tomb, and rose again on the third day and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. In other words, check yourself. Are you part of the family? Or are you just come for the visit? And the last thing is this. If you are a Christian, if you are born again, you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I just want to remind you that life doesn't get easier. Like, when you enter through the narrow door, the work doesn't end. It's just beginning. And, and the reason for that is because when you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it requires commitment, self-denial, refining. The Lord puts you to the fire. He refines you. We have dross and impurities in our lives, and the Lord will bring that to the surface. <laughs> it requires discipline, meaning he spanks that tail every now and then. Hebrews chapter 12. That's part of it. Not because he wants to inflict pain, but because he's after the fruits of righteousness. And on and on we could go. I just, I just want to remind you, life doesn't get easier. It's difficult, but it's worth it. Because those who endure to the end will be saved. Amen. Amen.